It's also the speaker for you for for Zoom. Okay. Do you want to stand in front of the camera so that you can see you? Not really, but I will. <laughs> is this okay, Jess? Yeah. Podium, so. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy McCormick. On behalf of the Board of Prop Memorial Library, thank you for joining us tonight um, with our talk with Paul, author Paul Greenberg about his book, The Climate Diet, 50 Simple Ways to Trim, trim Your Carbon Footprint. We are so honored to have partnered on tonight's program with the Friends of Greenwich Point, the Greenwich Conservation Commission, the Greenwich Shellfish Commission, and the Food, Ch Food Shed Network, all of which are doing outstanding work protecting our town and educating our residents on sustainable practices. Representatives from all those organizations are here tonight, so if you have a chance and want to learn more about them, um, please do. I'd be remiss at a talk on climate change without mentioning the work of another of our partners, Waste Free Greenwich which joined forces with the Greenwich Public Schools Green Schools Committee on a zero waste schools program. The proposal will be presented tomorrow at our Board of Education meeting, and they could really use your support. Um, some pamphlets are being distributed, um, and you can learn more from Julie Deschamps, which is here, and Angie from Green Schools, if you have any more questions. I also want to thank the members of the Prop Memorial Library Association, whose generous contributions make programs like these possible. If you are not a member, please consider joining. Details can be found on our website, propmemoriallibrary.org. Thank you, as always, to Jess Reed of Greenwich Point Marketing for all her work keeping Prop connected to the community. And thank you for helping us with tonight's Zoom. Copies of Paul's books are available for purchase and signing, thanks to Athena Books, our favorite new independent bookstore in Old Greenwich. If you're joining us on Zoom, please put your questions in the chat area and we'll be sure they are answered at the end of the talk. Now it is my honor to introduce our guest. Paul Greenberg is a New York Times bestselling author of Four Fish, The Future of the Last Wild Food, which also won a James Beard Award. He was a guest at Prot Library in 2014 to discuss his book, American Catch, The Fight mm -hmm. for Our Local Seafood. A former Greenwich resident and a Brunswick class of 85 graduate, Greenberg's writing on oceans, climate change, health, technology, and the environment appear regularly in the New York Times, the New Yorker, National Geographic, and many other publications. He's a frequent guest on national television and radio, including Fresh Air with Terry Gross. His PBS frontline documentary, The Fish on My Plate, was among the most viewed frontline films of the 2017 season, and his TED Talk has reached over 1.5 million viewers to date. He lectures widely at institutions around the country, ranging from Harvard to Google to the United States Senate. He's also the host of a podcast called Fish Talk. He is currently a professor at NYU in the Animal Studies Department. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to be back in Greenwich. Um, I always like to taunt the Greenwich audience by saying that if you have a pond, or a lake or a river in your backyard. I might have poached the fish out of the <laughs> river or pond. Um, I was an avid follower of lakes, rivers, and ponds when I was a kid. Um, and, you know, as Catherine was very um, kind to introduce me, um, I'm really first and foremost a fish guy um, who has sort of been on a tortured journey towards climate. Um, and people, if they tend to know me, they tend to know me for four fish, um, the book that I did back in 2010. Um, I often say, you know, the writing situation is is sort of you know you like to think that a lot of it has to do with 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 uh talent and hard work but there's a lot of luck involved um four fish happened to have so there's this three month period before a book comes out when it's either surging ahead or dead in the water most readers don't really know this but literally if stuff is not happening three months before your book comes out you know you go to the place like this and there's two people in the audience and so, <laughs> so it was very sad so fortunately for me but unfortunately for the rest of um, the environment three months to the day from four fish coming out um there's a small problem with an oil rig in the gulf of mexico <laughs> who here remembers the bp horizon uh, spill and that was like this ongoing advertisement for the ocean Remember every single day you were watching the oil pour into the Gulf of Mexico again and again and again. So by the time my book came out, I, honestly, in Four Fish, there was not very much to do with oil exploration. It was about fishing and aquaculture. Um, but 
everyone it's like somebody's got to be there to talk about the ocean so i ended up doing a lot of that kind of stuff so from there the book did pretty well and um, i've gone on to do a lot of other fishy stuff for fishes in a bunch of countries um as um, Catherine mentioned that's on the front line in a ted talk and um went on to write an entire marine trilogy at least that's how i sold that's how i sold the third book they were kind of getting tired of me after the second book um but i was but it's a trilogy so um that got people very excited so anyway so before um i launch you know head first into the climate conversation though um catherine told me that there might be a fishy crowd i don't know i never know like raise your hand if you've ever been fishing fishy crowd okay um raise your hand if you're the kind of lunatic that would cast a lure into a puddle if there was a two percent chance you might catch them in them. yeah there you go <laughs> usually it's the kids so yes so it's always good those are where the, the couple i was one of those kids and i can prove it to you because there i am as one of those kids um, so that that is actually the the photo is taken by my father who sadly passed away this week and uh, it's really the guy who got me fishing um in a really exciting and excitable way he always took me for the big fish you know, we were divorced dad family, so we would go to the city, to Long Island, not talk for the big fish. But here in Greenwich, I coached in your ponds, I coached in your rivers, I caught the little fish. Um, and what kind of got me interested in um, writing about fish, I mean, I wrote, used to write for a publication called The Fisherman, highly original title, um, New England edition. And I remember actually I sent this picture into The Fisherman, because there was a, there's a part of The Fisherman that's just mostly kids holding up fish. And then the next year I wrote an article for the fisherman and I was highly paranoid that they were going to connect the kid <laughs> with the author. But nevertheless, I got $60, um, but only invested it in technology then. I wouldn't be happy to stay here today. But in any case, what really got me interested in writing about fishing is that, you know, when I started fishing um, here and I often fished in Grand Harbor, I had a little boat um, that was leaking and all that kind of stuff. And um, while I wouldn't have necessarily caught every single fish on this list in Long Island Sound, these are the kind of fish that were known to frequent these areas. And I remember this was, you know, I was not a great athlete. I think sometimes there's, if someone were to draw an inverse equation between athletics and fishing ability, oftentimes if you're a little bit of a spaz on lacrosse field, chances are you're a dynamite fisherman. And um, that was me. And so, whereas, Regular sports just have three seasons a year. You know, you get your soccer in the fall, your hockey in the winter, lacrosse in the spring. I did them all, did them all badly. I still have those sores on my butt from riding the bench. Um, but um, if you're a fisherman, a fisher person, it's an endless parade of seasons. You know, like you'd have um, starts off with, you start off with winter flounder around St. Patrick's Day, and then the mackerel used to come in to Long Island Sound in April, and then we'd start to see weak fish, and then we'd start to see striped bass and bluefish and all these kinds of things. And it was just this endless, endless opera of nature that was going on. Um, but as things progressed, and as the quality of work in Long Island Sound got bad, and as um, overfishing became an issue, um, when I came back as an adult, uh, the other inverse equation, of course, is that um, pursuing fish and pursuing um, a mate are actually inversely proportional. So my fishing <laughs> Jones dipped precipitously as I approached 16, 17. Um, but then of course, as you enter middle age, perhaps your interest in mating declined. Maybe you have a few offspring. And lo and behold, the fishing gene appears, flares again, and you're fishing like no tomorrow. When I did do that, though, and I went back to my home waters, what I found was was more like this, um, and that there had been a tremendous reduction, not only in the numbers, but in the kinds of fish that were going on here. Um, and, you know, being a somewhat morose person, um, I also kind of am always intrigued by lost things, particularly with fish. And, um, you know, once upon a time in the North Atlantic, for example, Atlantic salmon were up and down our coasts, up and down coast of Europe, and they migrated to these central places in Iceland and off of Greenland. <coughs> Excuse me, pardon, I apologize, I have a little bit of cough. Not COVID, I already had COVID twice, so I'm, I'm safe. Um, boosted and all that. Anyway, um, so I was always fascinated. I actually lived way back on John Street in backwards Greenwich, and we had a little mill pond there. And I had this fantasy of actually starting a, sa a salmon run in the river that fed into the Byron River. I was going to have my own private salmon run. Um, but as I kind of researched that as an adult and came to understand the obstacles to restoring what we've lost, and I just 
this this slide always gets me. Um, this is a map of our your state of Connecticut. Every dot on that map is, is a dam. So there are over 3,000 dams in the state of Connecticut. I often say this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. Um, their, their chi is blocked. If we could just <laughs> unblock Connecticut's chi. Um, but all these big dams, um, you know, a lot of them are still here. And we just actually did a lovely tour of the fish ladder on the Minas River. Great, love your fish ladder. Take time again. That's my advice. Anyway, um, but um, I'm getting climate and I'm sort of working my way there. So, you know, fascination with lost wildness, lost opportunities. And that eventually drew me to Alaska, to this place, to Bristol Bay, which is the greatest uh, sockeye salmon fishing fishery in the world. As many as 50 to 60 million fish come into this system every year. Um, and I became intrigued there because of a number of different fights that were going on. But just so amazing that there are so many salmon there and the fishermen will appreciate it. There's so many salmon there that people don't even fish for salmon. They tend to fish for rainbow trout, of course. Um, because those are the rarer fish. And I remember I caught this rainbow trout. And rainbow trout um, in that system, they actually feed on rotting salmon carcasses. So if you want to catch rainbow trout, you use something called a flesh fly, which actually looks like a piece of rotting salmon flesh. And so these fish are super, super charged, super powerful. And this fish was so strong that it slipped out of my guide's hands. Um, <laughs> and it kept going. <laughs> and it kept going. <laughs> and it kept going. This, this is not Photoshop. This is actually this fish. And he caught the fish. <laughs> and then he slipped it gently into the water and the fish was like this and then shot off at 10 knots against the 10 knot current. So just an amazingly energetic system. And um, it's just, it's not just a sport fishery, it's a commercial fishery with these incredibly har amazing harvests of salmon every year. And they're caught by these handsome fishermen who fish under rainbows. It's amazing. <laughs> um, and it's just an amazing, and so that really kind of inspired me and uh, got me really excited. But then I found out that, um, you know, this is the way Crystal Bay looks. Notice no dams, no nothing. Amazingly pristine ecosystem. But this was for a long time what was coming down the pike. Um, a huge copper and gold development known as the Pebble Mine. And it was something that um, became more or less like a eight to 10 year obsession of fighting this mine. Um, it was um, effectively killed under the Obama administration. And then it was effectively revived under the Trump administration um, with this sort of insane idea that somehow there was a connection between the copper that they were gonna harvest and windmills and all those kinds of things, but basically they were out for the gold. And so it became this huge, huge fight, huge environmental fight. And it was so weird because during the height of the Trump administration, the Trump administration personally went out there to invalidate um, a 404C a clean water action on that watershed, shut it down, brought in um, uh, this whole string of investors to try and get it going. And really it looked like it was about to happen. It was just towards the end of the Trump administration. It was just on the verge of possibly going through. But weirdly, amidst all of this, Donald Trump Jr. posted this picture of himself and Donald J Trump III in Bristol Bay with a salmon. And he's saying, um, if you haven't read about the journey these amazing fish make and the transformation they make in their life, you should because it's unbelievable. And then, but meanwhile, like his father is going ahead with destroying this entire ecosystem. So we did this, we grabbed that photo, we put it in the New York Times and put this the wrong line for the wrong place. Um, a proposal, Alaskan mine threatens the planet's largest spawning ground for sockeye salmon and lays bare Trump's gaslighting of American sportsmen, because that was what was going on. So I fought and fought and fought. I wasn't the only one. There were many people involved in this campaign and we won. We won this month and it's done, finally. So, tremendous, tremendous success for the environment. Um, there's only one last step to take, which is to lock some up. Uh, but, um, I don't know what genius made this. I don't know if it was a Republican, I don't know if it's a Democrat, I don't know if it's an homage or a cheap shot, but it's just genius. If he is out there or she is out there, please come forward because I would like to give you a photo credit. Anyway, this is all by way of kind of preamble um, of what I wanna talk about tonight because we did all this action, we did all this work, we stopped this thing in its tracks, we just, you know, the forces were against us and we won. But then turn around and look at the temperatures in the water this year around the Bering Sea. And you start to see that we're fighting something much, much bigger. Something, it's almost quaint by comparison, what was going on with Pebble Mine. And so I realized that 
while I was known for four fish that I would need to go new and improve <laughs> now with climate diet, that I needed to really start to kind of, I mean, as I think all of us environmentalists feel, I mean, I can, you know, I know in this room and I know from my, my chats before this talk and the visit to the fish ladder over on the Mayanis, that we all have our treasured fights. You know, we want to save this bird or that river or that thing. You know, and I know even like Jonathan Franzen mixed it up with the National Audubon Society because he felt that they were too focused on climate and not focused enough on environment. So the, to me, the answer is got to do both. We, we have to have one foot in the climate fight and we have to have one fight in the kinds of things that a lot of people in this room are doing here in Greenwich. So <laughs> I ended up doing this little book called The Climate Diet and um, kind of revolved around the premise of, um, have you guys ever gotten into this kind of, you know, circularity in your head about on the one hand you really want to do something but on the other hand you're told that individual action doesn't matter right that we need ground up reef transformation of society and so forth and what is that where does that leave you completely and totally paralyzed so i was trying to think let's say let's just play devil's advocate here let's let's say all right, I want to throw my shoulder full bore into the climate fight personally and also politically. Then what would I do? And so what I did was I spent the next year, I said, I guess, interviewing different people in different disciplines, trying to get their number one or two things that we should do in their particular field. And so the book that I ended up with, The Climate Diet, is kind of a digest of their number one or two recommendations. But to begin with, you know. I think it's really an important, I, 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 oftentimes I toy with whether or not I'm writing for an international audience or whether I'm writing for an American audience. You know, and I toggle back and forth, like Four Fish was my first big fish book and then American Catch was the other thing. So it's like, who am I talking to here? But I think in the case of climate, we're really talking to Americans because um, you know, if you look at the share of global emissions by country, um, we seem, you know, we're, we're a big footprint, but not as big as China and um, India is certainly on the rise. And so you think, well, you know, those other countries got to reel it in before we have to reel it in. But then you take a look at sort of our per capita emissions. And the United, the United States is really right there near the top. Yeah, Saudi Arabia and Australia is above us, but they're much less populous nations. So the combination is that we are this country with um, very high personal climate impact and very high population. So the combination makes us an extremely important population to reform its ways. I mean, who's been to Europe recently? I suppose that's sort of a loaded question, but I, I was just really struck after two years of not being in Europe about how much further along Europe is in terms of all questions of energy um, conservation and, and green technology. And you just look at it across the board. In the United States, 15 um, tons of, of CO2 emissions per person per year. Um, UK, five or six. France is down like three. Now, a lot of that is because of um, their commitment to nuclear power, which we can discuss, and I'd like to discuss that. But we are not there on a societal basis. And yet, you know, people often say, oh, well, that's because it's an undeveloped country like India. You know, they only have 1.5 tons of carbon per person per year. Well, developed countries can do this, and they are doing this. And frankly, we're looking like a laughing stock when compared to the rest of the world at this point. I was just noticing that India is going to be announcing high-speed rail in the next few years. Where is our high speed rail? So I don't know, I won't get hung up on these. Anyway, so to me, this sort of personal question is political insofar as that everyone, I think at this moment of climate activism or this climate, climate emergency has to be an activist in some kind of way. And we have to find our kind of scalability in this and within demographics and within um, different uh, bioregions, um, I think to be um, one of the things that the, the sort of archetypal situation that came to mind is, you know, that moment when your child goes off to college and they come back a total jerk, you know, like, you know, <laughs> you know oh no, you can't do this. And I was just thinking about, you know, the, the, the child who comes to the Thanksgiving dinner who crosses their arms and won't touch the gosh darn turkey. And it's like, you, you can feel the energy, you can feel the loggerheads mashing together. And I guess what I wanted this book to do was to kind of try to meet people on a number of different levels, um, on a number of different actions and a number of different places where there is a graduated response. Yes, we are way behind, but I do believe there's a place for everybody in this country to do a little bit better. So I guess that was sort of the, the question, what are those, what are those 
changes? What are those personal changes that we need to do? So the book is divided up um, into these uh, six sections, eating and drinking, making family, staying home, leaving home, spending and saving, fighting and winning. Um, it was very much colored by the pandemic. Um, I pitched the book. Actually, the book came about because I'd written an op-ed for the New York Times um, right around New Year's. Um, often a good time to pitch an op-ed in case anyone writes an op-ed. But basically, the idea was that you know, remember, you know, the day after New Year's, you're feeling like a fat slob and you've overeaten, you've overdrank. Like, oh, I really got to reel it in. So my metaphor in this case was like the United States has basically been on a bender for the last. 50 or 60 years in terms of carbon. <laughs> and so what's that diet that we need to go on? So I, that's what I did in the op-ed. And then I was able to sell the book soon after, but then soon after that, um, this little pandemic started. And then I had to kind of, it, it was both an opportunity and a frustration. Frustration in so far as this was meant to be a small book next to the register, um, but there was no register suddenly. Um, but it was also, but, but opportunity opportunity there because we, we saw and all of us witnessed the ways that people radically changed their lives. So all of this sort of theorizing about, well, what if people didn't drive? What if people didn't, you know, suddenly, oh, actually it can happen if, this, if the threats are high enough. So tonight I'll talk um, a little bit, probably focus more on the eating and drinking th side of things. Um, I have a few other things thrown in there about other aspects of your life. But if you want to go into greater detail, we can talk about it a bit, but also it's all in the book. So um, the first thing is to kind of understand from a food perspective what your footprint is. And I have a feeling this is a pretty sophisticated crowd here, but I'll just go over some of the numbers that I think are pretty widely accepted at this point. So I'm sorry, apologies for the metric system. It's Sorry, it's a system everyone else in the world uses and we don't. Um, but um, I think you guys can make the conversion 2.2 pounds or something for a kilo. But basically, okay, so a pound, a kilo of beef is going to result in 27 kilos of carbon emissions. Pretty high. A lot of people decide, okay, well, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to go vegetarian. Surprise, surprise, cheese is a very high carbon product, um, mostly because you have to raise a cow in order to make the cheese. But, um, so, you know, all those vegetarians out there who are gobbling up cheese are not necessarily doing the planet the best favor they could do it. Surprisingly, what's interesting is the chicken. Um, uh, chickens, 6.9 um, uh, kilos of carbon, kilo of food on the table. This is largely because tremendous efficiencies um, in chicken um, uh, farming have come, across, uh, come about. Like, you, know, you can basically get go from an egg to a chicken in a couple of months. That's pretty amazing. Um, and you know, this, this whole chicken idea came to me um, by a nonprofit called Changing Taste. And you know, again, they were kind of looking at this, well, what can we do that's sort of incremental that can get some people on board without alienating a lot of people? And they ran the numbers on this and said that changing American beef eaters into chicken eaters would cut US emissions by 10%. That's their number. I'm always a little bit doubtful of certain numbers, but it would certainly be significant. My friends, the fish are back here. Um, another thing that I really um, advocate for is responsible seafood sourcing. So fishing can go a lot of different ways as far as carbon emissions, but the main thing is that wild fish are generally less expensive from a carbon perspective because you don't have to grow them, nature grows them. So um, all that effort that's put into animal husbandry um, in um, farmed animals, nature kind of takes care of that. Now, there are catch methods that are worse than others. Um, you know, stopping and starting hauling lobster pots, all that kind of stuff, very high carbon intensive. Um, dragging the very bottom of the ocean um, for flounder and things like that that you have to literally, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty fundamental. You just, you're doing this, it's a lot more energy than just doing this. So this fish, um, the Alaska pollock, which by the way is in your filet of fish sandwich if you eat those sandwiches nowadays, very, very carbon efficient, only 1.6 kilos. Um, and even better um, though, of course, is a plant-based diet. So um, lentils, you're talking about 0.9 kilos of CO2. But, and this is what I think is interesting. And I, and I also think that you know orthodoxies can get people into trouble because they back themselves into the corners without actually seeing what other possibilities are out there. So like, I'm vegan, boom, boom. And I've been a vegan, I was a vegan for two years. I know the language, I know how it talks. I know that the vegan is the least, um, let's say, pleasant dinner guest. <laughs> that moment, like, and I'm vegan. And like, you could just get, oh. 
I mean, so personally, my policy, I'm vegan plus fish at home. But when I go out, I, I have a, sorry, I, use a, I have a, a no-asshole policy when I go out to dinner, <laughs> and I try to avoid being a jerk. Now, if you want to stick to that, it's fine. But I just think, uh, it's a long story. But, um, but so here's a case where it's interesting. Um, look at the muscle, right? 0. 0.6 kilos of CO2 of emissions, and that's a farm muscle. Um, why is that? Well, a muscle, uh, again, is mostly, it's kind of like a farm muscle is kind of an oxymoron. It feeds itself. It's filtering the water. It's taking nutrients out of the um, water and the process actually denitrifying the water. So you can kind of get around questions of dead zones and things like that. So <laughs> those kinds of things of, you know, to me, the term that's been banded about lately is climatarian. And I think that a climatarian should really consider mussels, clams, oysters as a kind of mainstay of what they're going to eat. Now, of course, there's always, you know, people out there, well, how low could you really go? If I really wanted to go all the way down, I did um, find a couple of people who were working on this. Turns out, if you really, really wanted to be the most annoying dinner guest, you would just have carrots and anchovies. Day after day after day. Um, this mostly, the, the, I mean, when you get into, when you go into the world of carbon footprints and that kind of stuff, you can drive yourself pretty much insane in the fine scale ways you parse these things. But this was an interesting study that was done out of the University of Washington, where the PhD guy who was working on this looked at carbon impact, greenhouse gas emissions relative to nutrients. So what's a nutrient? Well, there you go, it's already a kind of difficult thing. But generally he was really came out very pro-carrot and anchovy and actually did, um, I was invited onto a cooking show to cook this over a webcast. So I did in fact make a dish, actually it was carrots, anchovies and mussels and pasta. And it wasn't bad. So, you know, if you want the recipe, we can discuss it later. <laughs> Stepping back from the whole thing though, um, I think what we're looking for is that, you know, right now <clears throat> we do, Americans eat what's called the standard American diet, abbreviated as the SAD. So we're, most of us are on the SAD. You know, we have all these, you know, cows and pigs and chickens, a big pile of junk over here in a bag. And I'm like, oh yeah, this doesn't get food nutrition all over. Um, <laughs> The, over the last few years, I think people have become re-excited about the Mediterranean diet. Um, Mediterranean diet, I was just in Crete. Um, I teach a course in the Mediterranean diet um, for Northeastern University every um, other year. And that situation is, you know, this to me is like the sort of non-jerky way of being mostly vegan. So that, you know, when you look at the total amount of animal protein that is in the Mediterranean diet, you're really looking at just numbers of ounces on a monthly basis. And the bulk of it is really pulses, grains, fresh vegetables, and olive oil. And that could even be improved. And you know, looking at things um, from a sort of holistic point of view, what something I'm trying to brand so that it can retire called the pescatarian <laughs> diet is would be trying to move that protein part of the Mediterranean diet and make it mostly um, fish and sustainably farmed shellfish. So that's something that has been on my mind. So that's the big overview. All right. So that's that's the meal. That's that first part about sort of carbon footprints and food. Um, next thing, of course, is to fly less and avoid flying food. Um, flying less is obviously really, really important. Um, a single transcontinental or um, overseas flight can be about the same budget, carbon budget, as is currently used by the average citizen of India. So flying is really, really um, not a good thing. And trying to kind of consolidate the flights, also flying directly versus stopovers, even though it might be more expensive. It's the taking off and the landing, really it's the taking off where a great deal of the bulk of the fuel is used. So trying to avoid, if you're gonna fly, try to fly directly. But flying food is really another big thing. So, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I think a lot of times you're not, a, I think we all have this like fixation with fresh fish. Oh, is it fresh? Is it fresh? Um, Fresh fish needs to be flown, if otherwise it's gonna spoil. But look at the difference in terms of flying versus shipping something. Flying a fish, um, 6.8 tons of CO2 per ton of food flown, whereas if you ship it, it's 0.14 tons of CO2. Huge, huge difference. Um, now, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that the stuff that's shipped tends to be frozen. Once you bring it down to temperature, you think, oh, what about all the energy freezing? It actually doesn't take that much energy. Once you've got it frozen, you put it, lock it up in a hold of the ship, 
all the wild salmon that you get is coming by ship through Panama, through down West Coast through Panama Canal to you. It's very low carbon emissions kind of thing. So avoiding flying food at all costs is good. Uh, fresh fish, uh, fresh, fresh non-local fish, try to avoid that. Um, try to avoid fresh berries out of season. Um, certain, there's, I go into it a bit more in the book, but there are certain things that you should kind of keep your eye on and try to avoid those. Another, and I'm really glad to see that my hometown of uh, Greenwich, Connecticut is really addressing this food waste issue. Um, as I was saying to my brother, who's here tonight as well, when we grew up in Greenwich, we were very pro food waste. Um, uh, you know, the, the big scrape, we both worked at restaurants, you know, big scrape after a wedding into the garbage. Um, actually, and it continues. I was just actually on a wedding on, on Long Island where there were two entrees. And like every single plate scraped into the garbage, like at least half, like, you know, unless you wanted to like, have a coronary and eat both countries. So I didn't really quite understand that, but fixing your waste management is really important. Um, you can do it in a number of ways. Um, a lot of it is, has to do with thinking about your shopping strategy before you go into the supermarket in the first place. Um, but on the end side of things, um, one of the things I really like about the climate movement is that I am inherently cheap. And uh, it's this thing, and always I just always look cheap, but now I look virtuous. And um, <laughs> I, think, I think it's really a great thing that you know, I really, since I've become, I would say, I would call myself a planetarian, the things that you can do when you look at every vegetable as a whole thing, when you look at every fish as not just two fillets, but a rack can be made into soup, a head that can be um, uh, processed and turned into stew, all these kinds of things make me very excited to be in the kitchen and to do interesting things. But the other, of course, important, really important thing is composting. Um, methane is one of the key things that gets generated by compost. I think a lot of people think that composting is, oh, it's just about closing the life cycle, da, da, da. but it's really about eliminating methane. Methane can be 56 more times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. The United States has greater landfill emissions than any country um, and the equivalent of 37 million cars on the road each year. So dealing with the food waste issue can really be a big changer. Um, another interesting thing is electrification. Um, when I talked to a lot of people, a lot of help on this on this book came from the Natural Resources Defense Council, and they really did a lot of work in looking at how the home can be better. But when you think about it, right, we're all excited about wind and we're excited about solar, and that's going to come to us in the form of electricity. If we don't have electricity on the other end in our homes, then what are we going to do with all this alternative energy? So a really important thing is to get rid of your gas range and to start moving towards electrification. A um, couple of reasons to do that. One is that um, just the simple waste of energy that happens when you use gas is incredible. 50% of the energy up in the air. Um, also, a lot of um, potentially harmful chemicals coming into your lungs through the cooking on gas. Um, but look at if you use an electric burner, um, um, and I actually had to do an in-situ experiment in my building, they cut off the gas line, and I live in Manhattan, and uh, there was a leak and we lost our gas for a year. And so I bought a simple two top, two burner um, induction electric stove for $150. Um, induction electric uses a kind of magnetism. So if you can put a magnet on a pan and it sticks, you can use it as an induction pot. And that really very efficiently conducts the energy directly to your stove. These things have gotten really, really precise. I'm a chefy person. I, you know, definitely, I can, I can go head to head with the chefiest person. And I can say that I prefer now to cook on electric rather than gas. Um, it's exciting. And there are other ways to get electricity into your home. Um, uh, probably some of you, anyone here have a heat pump in their, in their house? So one, okay, good. Next time I come back, everyone will have a heat pump. Um, heat pumps, you know, basically instead of, they, they are moving heat around rather than necessarily using that, you know, using energy to, to either heat or cool. So um, it's a more complicated than that, and it's above my pay grade as far as explaining from an engineering point of view. Um, but suffice to say, it is an interesting new technology, and it's where a lot of stuff is going in terms of climate. Because um, in addition, to probably it's your heating and cooling system is the largest source of energy drain on your house. So addressing that is really, really key. The other sources are out there and they're in the book and we can go into it greater detail. Um, the other thing is to change the grid, even if you cannot get, get off of it. Um, what I mean by this is that there is actually a lot of 
of alternative energy being generated right now. Um, but you need to be set up to use it. And you do now have the opportunity to choose your um, electricity provider. And you can choose an electricity provider that is sourcing renewably. Now, debate is renewable, is hydro renewable, if it's damming a river and messing up a salmon run, debatable. But it's certainly better from a greenhouse <laughs> perspective. So um, I personally have made this change. It's resulted in no change in cost for me. Um, and um, it allows you to get this electricity back into your home, to your home directly. Um, and you know, the argument being that, again, going back to this question of personal choice or political choice, if we can create a market that is funneling and directing investment towards these positive technologies, it's a political action to some degree. You know, it's a little bit like the energy equivalent of voting with your fork. And people criticize that, but at the same time, making those markets, getting that momentum going is really, really important. Um, this comes out of the pandemic. Um, since you're already eating better at home, stay home for work. And I know, you know, I grew up in Greenwich and I certainly commuted into the city to work back in the day, but I think we really do need to rethink um, this whole thing. Um, I was talking with the director of the library before he said it takes him an hour, 45, 45 minutes to get from Wilton to here, which I just find, you know, unfathomable. So um, this move to telecommuting, telecommuting, I think, even though like I stand to lose quite a bit, if nobody comes back to work in Manhattan, I literally live at ground zero in Manhattan. I would like from a real estate perspective, everybody to raise the property values. But I, from a personal perspective, I have to say, stop the commuting. Um, commuting to work accounts for 70% of all emissions generated by American. So along those same lines of uh, what we're talking about with electricity, another thing is to put your hard earned salary to work for the planet. Now, the next slide I'm gonna show may be out of date because of this um, crazy time we're in of booming prices of oil and gas. But prior to this latest craziness, it was true that fossil fuel free version of this S&P 500 outperformed the traditional S&P over the last five years. So I do believe that's going to continue. I do believe that we're in something of a glitch at the moment. And I do believe that it's gonna be sort of a rocky road during this energy transition, I mean, I think a lot of people have different views about how we need to do this. Do we need shock therapy and go right into renewables right away? Do we need to figure out an economic way to get there? Nevertheless, I do believe that if you are an investor, if you are um, maintaining a stock portfolio, that you owe it to the planet and you actually can probably do okay financially um, if you start looking towards these green investment structures. I actually, during the course of working on this book, I spent a lot of time on the phone with a really interesting guy at Colorado who was doing a green investment fund. And he pointed out that one of the things he was working on at the time, I had to check back with him, was that he found that there was a positive correlation um, between companies that were transitioning to renewables and, and overall profit, that there seemed to be an algorithm that made that seem to hold true. Now, if that is true, um, then there is a, a really interesting investing possibility where you're not just investing in places that are already green, but if a company shows transition, you know, if they can somehow, that can somehow be picked up by investors, that could potentially be a really cool way to move companies in the right direction. Don't look at my stock portfolio though for great examples of wealth and fortune. So a um, couple last points I'll make before opening up to questions is, is I don't think that shaming is really working very well. And I go back to the sad vegan at the dinner out. Um, I think this is a question of kind of getting everybody on board as much as possible. And if you can move your aunt in Peoria from beef to chicken without acrimony, I think it's a much more positive step than waving radishes and a red flag in her face. So um, I think it's, you know, th these are more sort of social norms that we have to think about. But I think that this sort of high and mighty position that some of us take when we say become climatarians or become climate focused in our, in our lives, we have to be really careful about it. And which leads me to my last point, which is that you have to make your life your argument and you have to lead by example. Um, believe it or not, it took me a really long time to change my energy service provider to a renewable thing. I don't know why I had this block about it. I just wasn't doing it. I wasn't doing it, I wasn't doing it. Finally, it was my partner who said, you know, we really, <coughs> we really gotta do this. And I was like, she was happened to be at the green market or the sign up booth, we did it. And I feel better before it. And I'm able to, I think, with a clear conscience, talk about these things publicly, knowing that I'm doing the best that I can do. And I think everyone can do better.
think there's a single message to this book. We all can do better. So that's basically it. Um, these are all my various handles. Um, I um, keep a medium column where I do sort of more up to the minute things uh, about climate and so forth. Um, I continue to write about fish. I continue to make movies and you know do different kinds of things. I'm in the process of trying to make my 19 or 2003 Honda Civic. I'm hoping to strip the um, internal combustion guts out of it um, and replace them with electric vehicle components um, for a film, but we'll see. Um, you know, it's all kind of a weird, crazy experiment. And I think, I hope that we'll all join me in this weird, crazy experiment. So that's, that's my talk, but I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. I think, I think we'll have some questions. From, are we getting any, is anything dropping in the chat yet? Okay. I can also answer my, ask my own questions myself. Um, yes. Yeah. I've been curious about this for a while. Um, I use a garbage disposal. Yeah. I want to go like food down that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what happens to that? Is that okay? <laughs> Should I stop making an effort to be you no know, composting and instead, like, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? So, I don't, knowing what I know about wastewater treatment, I don't think it's ideal because it's just one more chunk of organic matter that the waste that the municipal sewage system has to take on. Are you, I assume you're on city septic? Yeah. Um, so I, it wouldn't be my first preference. I think the better thing is to compost, um, find a relationship with the garden, you know, use, I know, I understand that the town is increasingly moving towards composting. Um, and, you know, also I come at this from a, just a, a fish perspective, that the less human stuff that goes in the waterways um, you know, interesting fact, um, in New York City, if it ever rains more than a tenth of an inch in New York City, um, raw sewage goes into the waterways uh, because we have what's called a combined sewage overflow, CSO, and um, it's crazy. I mean, you know, who would think in this day and age that we're pumping raw sewage into the water? So overall, if there's a question about less human stuff in the water, I would, I would pay for that. Yeah. Yes. Two, two things. You didn't talk about nuclear. Oh, and yes. Then, and then you talked that you didn't talk about like, Germany blowing so natural gas. Yeah, yeah. And now they've really got their own. Problems. Yeah. I, I have to tell you, you know, I, you know, I was born and I grew up in the era of the China syndrome and, you know, and Three Mile Island and all that kind of stuff. And so my knee jerk response to nuclear has been, um, you know, in the Germany direction. But I, I actually have been won over um, increasingly, mostly because of. The example of France, um, I think that nuclear power can be made safe um, and it's zero emissions and the technology is here right now. So, um, you know, it's kind of like we are in a real trough climate wise and we really need to throw everything against the wall as possible, you know, it, and I do believe nuclear is one of those tools. Of course, the fantasy is nuclear fusion that will get there someday, but I'm not so sure that that is going to be something that we're going to see in our lifetimes. Um, and yeah, Germany has you know dug themselves into a trough both um, economically and also politically. You know, like you know, I, so I should the side story. Um, I was actually a Russian major in college, so and I wrote my graduate dissertation on Soviet environmental policy. Worked a lot in Russia, and um, I could see what was coming. You know, as Russia moved into the world of um, the West and was increasingly becoming this sort of like basically the Saudi Arabia of the North. Do we want to be involved with those kind of people? I don't think so. I think, you know, I think I'd rather trust science and decent engineers to kind of bring that, that thing forward. So, you know, sue me, but that's sort of where I stand. Uh, yes. How do you feel about um, government involvement on the local level versus the state level versus the federal level? I'm asking because I moved from Brennan to Palo Alto where we've just gone gas free. So every oh, wow. building has to be no fossil fuel. Oh, we're interesting. Not renovating an old house and we have to go all electric. Oh, wow. Which is great. I mean, but I just wondering how do you feel about those kind of uh, hard and fast rules and do we need those? And do we need it by town or by state? I think that we do need some big overarching mandates like that uh, on a federal level. Um, getting those through politically is another story. I mean, of course, it's Palo Alto that you're able to do that. And I don't, you know, if you were to, I, 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 I would love it. If there would be some sort of national mandate on it, would Georgia and Alabama secede from the Union? Maybe if that were to happen, you know, and what would that do for the climate, you know, generally speaking? Um, I think, you know, climate people are in a very tough place politically right now. 
And um, I kind of like, it's weird though, because I've been talking about this book across the country. I've come across a number of pretty conservative people who have Teslas, who want to be off the grid, who are investing in all these technologies, but they don't want to be associated with the climate movement in one way, shape or form. So I guess my answer to your question is a little bit ahead of a hedge in so far as I think uh, whatever works is really what I would go for. And reverse engineering your question, I would say that there are political moments to engage with as a citizen that don't necessarily have to be the president or Congress. And that sometimes um, decisions made even on a school board level about we were, um, I was speaking with um, somebody over at the, uh, I was speaking, we were speaking over at the Minas River about food, food waste policy in schools, just like getting schools to eliminate trays, for example, like, you know, remember in college when football <laughs> players would have 12 glasses of milk and half of it would go in the garbage later on. So just, just that simple thing. And where would that decision be made? Probably on a school board level. I'm not really sure, but, you know, so I guess what, what, what works, yes, but knowing that we're in a very politically dicey time, um, hedgy, but that's my best shot at my question, <laughs> that complicated question. Yes. Hi there. Um, so within the context of food and climate, um, where does globalizing and nationalizing our food system kind of work in your framework? And, and yeah. And to piggyback on that, you know, given that uh, maybe this is a flying food, maybe, but also that uh, globalized nationalizing systems help to minimize food loss. Yep. And then a sub question to that is, um, in the, you know, do you, do you touch on how cattle are raised in the, in the context of what they were generally practicing right. in agriculture um, in comparison to, let's say, industrialized chicken? So, how do you do right. all that? Okay. And <laughs> the answer to question <laughs> one, subset <laughs> two. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. Um, so the local food question came up quite a bit when I was speaking with food people looking at questions of carbon footprint. So when I've done other versions of this talk, I have a slide that said, eat local logically. So um, the, and the, and the logic comes in a few different forms. One of them is obviously following seasons. So, you know, even if your local farmer's market has delicious looking hothouse grown lettuce in December, Oftentimes it makes more climate sense to buy from California, even with the shipping and so forth, because you are potentially, you know, the energy inputs going in, you know, I can see you, you know, this issue, I can tell. And it's, it's debatable. The people that I spoke with generally saw, said, you know, eating in season with stuff that's in season without going towards the hot house is one of the major things to do. The other thing is just a sort of kind of what I would call boutique green market shopping that you have to be aware of. So the, 20 mile round trip drive to get ahead of broccoli at your green market is probably doing more climate damage than you know a big shop at a supermarket you know what i mean so being mindful that it's part of a whole system i think is part of that um to your other question now could you repeat the question yes. as you answer it for those that can't hear them? Oh boy, can I? Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I guess the question, first of all, the question was uh, uh, regionalizing, localizing the food system, how does that play into the climate question? Um, and then um, the, the uh, my, oh, with, regard, with regard to beef. Okay, so this is an interesting question. I mean, obviously in a, in a, in a regenerative system, hopefully, um, we're getting better grass growth, which is carbon sequestering, better health of soil, which again, you know, after the ocean, actually, soil is the big, biggest carbon sink out there. And we've lost a tremendous amount of the carbon sink potential of soil through industrial agriculture. So I do support anything that is regenerative in nature in terms of getting us to better carbon sinks in terms of soil. That said, the several people that I interviewed around the question of beef generally found beef high on the carbon scale, regardless of how it was farmed. Um, and it's just, you know, the chicken, it's really hard to beat the chicken. <laughs> chicken grows so fast and it's horrible the way chicken are raised. You know, I mean, I don't want to be a part of that system, but physics is physics to some degree. There, 
and you know, you, I can tell you're, you know, an incisive person, and I know that you've thought about these things quite a bit, and you know that when you get into these questions of carbon footprints and uh, life cycle assessments and stuff, they're very thorny questions. And one of the things I tried to do in the different sources that I consulted for this book, there was a lot of academics, you know, hedging is their middle, you know, middle degree, um, hedge, hegeotomy. And um, so I just would say, no, 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 just give me your best guess. And so universally, the people I spoke with tended to say, so that's what the answer I went with, which is not to say further down the road I might be disproved, but I don't think it's, um, I think if you really want to avoid all of these questions, being plant-based is really kind of the way to go, you know, across the board. So. As a, yeah. a comment, I have yeah. a meta question. Yeah. Um, Mira or Myra says, this talk was terrific. We need this everyday talk about what we can do, each of us. We can, in capital letters all do better and we actually really need folks like Paul Greenberg to tell us so. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> all right. And then um, I guess my email went through. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Haley asks, how do we take on the Goliaths of industrial agribusiness and CAFOs? CAFOs. CAFOs. Yes, confined animal feeding operations. Um, you know, this is one of those things where it's like there's the low, there's there's the voting with your fork thing, which will only get you so far, and then there's you know going to the barricades. Um, I mean, I, there are instances of communities in the Midwest stopping capos from being built, shutting them down. They're rare, um, but I think in those cases that political action is needed to a certain degree. Um, and as far as like large agro business is concerned, I mean, I I agree that. We need, we do need to support local agriculture. We do need to support, um, you know, other ways of food distribution as well. I mean, one thing that was, I got into this a bit when I was doing fish stuff more intensively, but the idea of local and regional food hubs for local producers, there are all these bottlenecks um, contained within the food system. I mean, even com coming down to like slaughterhouses and slaughtering animals, if you're going to eat animals, um, it's very hard to get um, your, if you're a, small grower of chickens or pigs or beef, really hard to get your animals processed. And so trying to kind of um, demonopolize that system is probably a really big deal. And, you know, again, a large part of it is also agricultural subsidies. Um, you know, I'm a constant advocate for fish. Um, there is something like $40 billion in subsidies every year, depending on how you calculate it, for corn alone. Um, all of, National Marine Fisheries Services and everything associated with fish in this country is a single billion. So 40 billion on corn, 1 billion on every fish in the sea. So right there, that's your tax dollars at work. Um, so I think you know, we have a farm bill coming up. You know, that's always, that's always a nightmare. Um, and we, you know, I, I was a Kellogg fellow at one point and I walked those corridors of the Department of Ag wondering how and how we're ever gonna reverse this kind of thing. But it's certainly something worth trying and something worth pursuing. So keep keep part of it. I mean, food our food footprint um, is debatable. You know, again, different people um, analyze it different degrees, but it's definitely a huge part of our carbon portfolio. Yes, in the back. Paul, well, you showed us the slide of all the dams in Connecticut. Yeah. And you mentioned the well to the uh, Minus River fish rally. Yeah. Uh, I've been a monitor there over the last ten years, and. Uh, we're going to need a better solution than the fish ladder. I agree with you. <laughs> we're going to have a healthy population of predator fish we have to have to forage fish. Yep. And right now, the forage fish, the herring, have no chance. Yep. I mean, the fish ladder, the entrance to the fish ladder, the big bass are just sitting there. Yes. So the, the fish have no chance. If it can get up the ladder, the cormorants are sitting there. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we, we have to find a way to can't take the dam out a way to get around the dam that's more natural. I mean, um, so you know, you know who really loves fish ladders? Power companies, <laughs> because it gives them an easy way to kind of say, oh, we've addressed the problem. Um, it's a mitigation strategy. It's even worse in some places that West, they literally take salmon, put them in a truck, drive up the hill and let them out. You know, how is that in any way a natural system? I don't know. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I think that there's a really good film out there called Dam Nation that's worth watching and worth sharing and worth showing in your classrooms if you're a student or a teacher. 
Um, we have a dam crisis, not only in this country, but in this world. Um, China, through its Belt and Road Initiative, is going on a huge dam building spree um, in Southeast Asia, you know, um, major rivers in subcontinent. So it's, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. Um, there's a really good uh, uh, writer and scientist named John Waldman, who has really made this focus of, this focus of his life, he wrote a book called Run, Running Silver. And he has a number of interesting strategies. His idea is that, you know, a lot of these, first of all, a lot of these dams don't really serve a purpose anymore. And if, if they are generating power, it's very little. But what is interesting is that some of these old dams um, still, even if they're generating much power, they have um, electricity lines going to the dam. So what if you knocked the dam out, opened up the river again, suddenly you have a floodplain that potentially is available for solar and you have transmission lines right there. What about that? That'd be cool. You know, you get the energy and you get the fish passage. I think the biggest pro bigger problem you have over here in the Mayanis is, you know, I grew up around here, I used to shop at the Fisherman's Den, um, which was over there, but is that people are gonna lose their water view and they're not gonna be happy about it at first. But I've seen instances like up in the Adirondacks, um, I did a story about um, the dam near Willsboro. So Lake Champlain used to have endemic Atlantic salmon that used the lake as the ocean and then migrated up the rivers. Um, there was a big dam for years in Willsboro um, and uh, they took it out. And people were really, they, oh, what are gonna happen to my swans? But now there's a beautiful roaring brook, you know, where salmon can get up to, yeah, and it's opened up 10, 15, 20 miles of spawning habitat. So that's really exciting, it's really transformative. So getting landowners to that point is hard. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if we're gonna get these fish swimming around the dam. I think you kind of gotta confront the dam itself. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens down the line. There was a great guy at the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, Energy and Environmental Protection named Steve Gephardt, who just retired. And I went on a number of sort of dam busting expeditions with him. And it was a lot of fun, really interesting, really informative. And I'd say, you know, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Southern Massachusetts, these, this is like ground zero of the little dam problem. And, uh, you know, this is really a great way. Like when people say, what can I do for the environment? Getting involved in this is really important. It's also a really good thing for just, um, you know, climate safety. Um, these little dams everywhere are huge flood risks, huge insurance risks. So getting rid of them is really, really, really paramount. I would say. There's a comment on here that says Connecticut alone has 4,000 dams. Yeah, I guess I sometimes, I go between three and 5,000, but yeah, that's about right. Um, Marianne says sharing a great resource, pasture bird chicken is generative farmed. Okay. Um, and somebody else asked, um, are you, is it local? Otherwise, are we back to shipping? <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Yeah, good, good, good to think through. So I think, are we, do we have one? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> small, small hands, big questions, yes. I don't ask a lot of questions with these sort of things, so I apologize if it's not that good of a question, but what are like the benefits and disadvantages of like aquaponics versus uh, local caught fish or um, shipped fish? Good question. When you say aquaponics, do you mean aquaculture or do you mean, you know, aquaponics is the co-growing of vegetables? And I mean aquaponics. You mean aquaponics, okay. First of all, never shoot down your own question. My mother, when she would bring food to the table, her first phrase was always, I'm sorry, it's so awful. <laughs> so never undermine yourself. Um, so aquaponics is an interesting thing. Um, you know, there's, there, people are talking about the idea where you basically use fish to nutrify the water, which allows you to grow plants and it's potentially closed system. Um, you know, some of the very early, um, <laughs> earliest aquaponics are thousands of years old. And in Asia, they would have systems where they'd had mulberry trees producing silkworms, producing silk, their casings dropping into the water, feeding carp who pooped in the water, which in turn fertilized grasses, which in turn, um, rice rather, which in turn fed ducks. So in an ideal world, that would be great. Um, I think the sticking point in terms of feeding the world, it's the, the, those systems are very, they were, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of, it's very labor intensive. And you tend to find them in Asia or places where labor is cheap. So I think for a, a country that is more subsistence oriented, it can work. Trying to make it international and a commodity based system will be difficult. How does it compare? I don't, I've never seen a carbon comparison of aquaponics per se. Um, I do know that 
trying to kind of understand aquaculture, more traditional aquaculture, where you're like feeding fish stuff and not growing the plants. But aquaculture, like an aquaculture with salmon, nobody really wants to come clean on these numbers, but as much as I can kind of guesstimate it, there's somewhere, an aquaculture with salmon is somewhere between a chicken and a pig, as far as carbon footprint. So no great shakes as far as carbon efficiency. Well, a good question. Yes. Um, in the transition, Yeah. Should you run out and grow your you know, two-year-old, you know, stovetop? Yeah. Into the dump, or do you? I mean, so you know, you know me. I've got my 2003 Honda Civic, and I'm going to turn it into an EV, and I'm cheap. Um, which, by the way, it's not very cheap to turn it <laughs> an internal combustion into an EV. Um, these, you, you, there are some weedy weeds here in terms of, you know, what's the carbon footprint. I, I generally not, I, I generally think using stuff until its last dying gasp is probably a good idea. On the other hand, um, you know, these, these um, electric stovetops are just so small and so efficient and so cheap that adding them on isn't such a bad thing. Like what I find is like, I still have my gas stove. I just don't use it very often. Like I use it for like a dinner party where I've got everything going. Or if for whatever reason, I can't seem to pop popcorn on an electric rig. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but um, but I think it's like kind of, instead of, you know, we all know the Amazon hound in our house who's like, I don't know, I don't know, you know four boxes appear. So trying to avoid that is probably a good idea. Um, and, you know, looking at each appliance in your house kind of like, is it ready to go? Like I, one of the reasons I'm, converting my car to electric is my mechanic said that my car was suffering from old car syndrome. And that literally, on, I was on the phone replacing the all on the phone. So, you know, you have to understand, <laughs> get more intimate with your stuff a little bit, rather than kind of using shopping as a panacea to just kind of move on, throw it on. So that's the best thing I can do. Yes. Hi, so um, your talk is great, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I'm blown away by it, and I always come and I'm like, oh, I wish I could bring all these people in. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, as a parent, school system and running into free lunches and then the amount of like single serve packaging and just all the different things in my mind. Most of the times when I have a conversation or I tell someone about tonight, it's like it's so overwhelming, yeah. you know, that they don't want to talk about it. And, yeah. and I'm always like, what's like the one thing that I can say? Like, well, maybe it's like, is it not EV? Is it Composting, like what is like the one? If you have someone who's sort of resistant to the idea, yeah. of it, if you have like a little. I mean, <laughs> I think it depends what kind of person you're dealing with, but I think the chicken to beef swap isn't bad. Yeah. You know, like just telling well, that you don't have. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> chicken is about as good. I mean, I'm the cook in my family. I would yeah. say that cooking chicken is just as bad as complicated as cooking beef. Um, so I think that's a pretty easy swap. Um, I don't know. I have to tell you, I get a little tired with how busy everybody is, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, before I wrote this book, my other little book, I did this book called um, Goodbye Phone, Hello World. And I'm, I'm a little bit um, violating my own truth. I am with my iPhone today, but generally, um, I'm actually, I, I use a flip phone most of the time. And um, I'm, I'm having to transition because they're getting rid of 3G. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I happen to think a lot of the busyness that is going on is fabricated. It's people checking social media, checking their texts. And I found that when I did switch to a flip phone, that I didn't feel as harried. And um, so I think, you know, in that book, it's another 50 things to do to blah, 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 blah. Um, that one is really, that, the, that page in that book is question busyness itself. You know, what are we really talking about here? I mean, I'm not discounting, like, you know, I have a teenager. I'm, constantly driving to Timbuktu to soccer. I always say 11 million people in New York City. You can't scrape together 11 children to play against my son. Do I, do I really have to go to Schenectady? <laughs> but anyway, I just think, um, so So beef chicken, easy one. Um, I think um, just, just maintaining an openness and not having the knee jerkness of I'm so busy, I'm so overwhelmed, and kind of taking that statement to task to some degree. 
All right, well, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I guess I'll go back to the table over there. And um, you see all my information there. Um, I would say that my most, the most regular writing that I do these days is on Medium, um, just because it's easy and I can get little thoughts, thought, thought cubicles out fairly easily. Um, but I welcome people to kind of uh, check in with me um, by Twitter or via um, whatever means they want to choose and um, to keep the dialogue going. And I'm happy, you know, if you have other organizations that would like a talk, let me know. I'm happy to figure out a way to come and see you. So thank you so much for coming. Absolutely. And I'll be in the back.